My name is John Simpson, mm -hmm. and I am an adjunct professor here at the Kogod School, uh, teaching classes in the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. uh, my focus has been music publishing and copyright, um, how the various entertainment industries work, uh, and given my background prior to coming here, uh, I talk a lot about the digital technology uh, wars of the last 15 years uh, and how it's changed the delivery of entertainment and how it's changed the business models um, and how it's changed expectation uh, from everyone along the lines of artists, songwriters, record companies, music publishers, agents, managers, uh, pr local promoters who put on shows. Mm -hmm. It's all changed. Everything's been, uh, you know, kind of rewritten, uh, all the, the rule book. My journey in the music industry has been a rather lengthy one and a very interesting one with a lot of different twists and turns. I uh, started out playing in bands after I saw the Beatles on TV mm -hmm. uh, and got a record deal when I was a sophomore in college and dropped out of college to go to London to record my first album and then I toured for a while and wrote songs uh, and toured colleges and things like that for a number of years. And uh, I jokingly uh, talk about getting so successful that I went to law school. Uh, so finished my undergrad degree and a master's sort of in my spare time while I was still touring and performing, and, and then went to law school. And frankly, I thought I was getting out of the music business when I went to law school. I did not think I'd get sucked back in again. Um, and yet within a year and a half of getting out of law school, uh, I found myself working at a firm that did a lot of copyright, that did a lot of visual artists, uh, sculptors, painters, art galleries, um, some pretty major uh, art collectors and major artists. Um, and through the firm and my knowledge of the music business, all of a sudden I started developing a music practice and representing a lot of different um, artists and songwriters and some filmmakers and, and it just kind of grew from there. In the late 1980s, my career took a very uh, interesting turn when uh, a local artist uh, and I, I got involved in managing her career. And uh, she went on to win five Grammys and sell millions and millions of CDs. And it was a, a wonderful 10-year uh, ride with a partner that I had managing uh, her career. Um, the artist is Mary Chapin Carpenter, who was from this area. Uh, in the DC area. And um, after managing Mary Chapin, I managed a number of other artists, uh, both uh, you know on major labels and independent labels. Uh, did a little bit of law practice in, this, um, in my spare time. Um, and then um, was recruited in the late like, 1999 to help launch a new trade association called Sound Exchange. And Sound Exchange is an organization now over 100 employees. I was the first full-time employee and I ran it from 2001 to 2010. And we're the organization that represents all the recording artists and record companies in the United States, collecting royalties from Pandora and satellite radio, XM and Sirius, uh, iHeart Radio, anybody that's streaming music online had to pay us for the music they were using. And our job was to figure out what was being streamed and then send checks out to the artists and send checks out to the labels whose music was being used. And it became a very significant uh, revenue stream. My last year we collected over $260 million. Um, and this year in 2012 it'll probably exceed $400 million. So it's a, one of the few bright spots in the music industry, a growth business. Um, and, uh, but leading that campaign I was involved in battles with Pandora in front of Congress on what the rates should be and whether they were paying too much or you know whether they were paying enough and the same was true we battled with over the air radio stations like Clear Channel and Bonneville because they don't pay anything when they use music and we think they should um, and I was also involved in the Napster lawsuit when Napster was sued uh, I got subpoenaed to testify um, it was one of the shortest depositions of all time and it was kind of foolish that they actually subpoenaed me I had really nothing to add to the the conversation uh, but I was involved in a lot of those digital, uh, you know, uh, intrigues of the last decade. And mm -hmm. so it's been kind of interesting having a bird's eye view, uh, being one of the chief spokes 
persons, you know, for the recording community uh, on the value of music and why it's important that we still value artists and the artistic contribution they make to society and to our lives and to make sure they get paid, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's, you know, in a time when payment for music and payment for any entertainment has become more and more voluntary, uh, it's incumbent upon us to protect artists more and more because it, it's harder and harder for them to make a living. Um, and there's this sense somehow, I think, within the, you know, certain segments of society that, oh, well, they should have a, a, a second job. And I think nothing could be worse for us as a society than to have uh, amateur artists. And uh, I mean, it may be fun to watch those videos on YouTube that people post, but it's not the same as seeing truly gifted people who have been trained and who've spent their lifetime learning a craft, whether it's songwriting or performing or playing the guitar or whatever it might be, or whether it's a symphony. Um, so, you know, I think it's really critical uh, that, we, that we help those folks. Mm -hmm. You know, interestingly, I mean, I grew up in a family where there was a lot of music. Um, and neither of my parents were professional musicians. My dad was a pretty good self-taught pianist, and he'd studied violin when he was a young guy, but he was in business. Um, and I had a grandmother who was a very good classical pianist, though not professionally, and another grandmother who was a singer, uh, a great-grandfather who was a cantor, which is a religious singer, you know, in the, in, in the temple. Uh, so there was a lot of music around me, and, and distant cousins who were orchestra leaders, you know, in the 30s and 40s. and um, so, you know, maybe I couldn't escape, but I mean, frankly, when I was a kid, uh, I always thought I was going to be governor of New York. That was the goal. Okay. I was very political, um, and I worked on political campaigns as a teenager uh, in the 1960s. Uh, Eugene McCarthy, who was running as an anti-war candidate in 1968, um, a number of local uh, candidates uh, in New York State where I grew up. And I always thought that was going to be what I was going to do. And then I saw the Beatles, and my life changed. Okay. And my best friends and I started a band the next week and after seeing them on Ed Sullivan. And within, you know, about a year we had created one of the top bands in our area and playing a lot of, you know, every weekend, a couple of nights a week. And I was in high school making, you know, pretty decent money. Uh, we made a record, though nothing happened with the record. But then as I said, you know, I, I went off to college, I sang at a lot of protests. It was during the 1960s, all that mm -hmm. stuff, and, um, and I got, quote-unquote, discovered. Um, you know, I've been part of the Grammy organization. It's, it's actually called the Recording Academy. It used to be called National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences. This is an organization that was started about 55 years ago to recognize excellence in recordings. And um, I joined the organization in the late 1980s, and there was no Washington, D.C. chapter back then. So I joined the Nashville chapter. And I guess it made sense. Uh, Mary Chapin Carpenter was signed in Nashville as a recording artist. And um, that was probably the chapter with the most relevance to me at the time. It was between there and New York. Um, and then in 1997, I actually helped launch the Washington, D.C. chapter. Uh, we got our own chapter from the Academy. And, you know, the Academy's best known for putting on the Grammys. Um, but they do a lot of other education work and music preservation, uh, advocacy here in Washington for artists' rights. And uh, it's a terrific organization. Uh, they have uh, some charities that help take care of musicians who are in trouble, who have addiction issues, who, for example, in Hurricane Sandy, a lot of musicians in Brooklyn lost their equipment, lost their studios, and they'll work with them to help rebuild. Um, so it's a, it's a terrific organization. I got very involved in the local chapter, uh, serving as its first national trustee to the national board uh, when we started the chapter, and currently I'm serving as the chapter president. So as the chapter president, I work with the local music community, trying to recruit members, trying to make sure that we put on the right programs for professional development um, and education uh, of our membership, networking opportunities, and in the last five to six years or so, Grandma U, 
which is aimed at university students, has been growing dramatically. And the idea was for the Grammys to recruit and find those kids who were really excited and passionate about the music industry and give them a, a, an inexpensive way, because it's only $50 for your four years of college or $25 a year. So it's a pretty inexpensive thing to join, and you get all of the information from the Grammys. You don't get to vote in the Grammys. You have to be, um, to, to vote in the Grammys, you have to qualify uh, as, a, as an artist, as a songwriter, as an engineer or a producer. You have to have some creative credits uh, in your past and in, in, in what you've done uh, to vote. But, um, but you still get a lot of the other benefits. Being able to buy tickets to go to the show, if, if that's something of interest to you. There's a lot of networking opportunities. Uh, Grammy U has had some backstage opportunities where, you know, some students have gotten to go on tour buses and see what it's like. Wow. Yeah, life on the road. They get to go to sound checks mm -hmm. at big concerts at the Verizon Center or at Lisner Auditorium or maybe here at Bender. Um, and, and there are artists like um, Alicia Keys, who's been really supportive, or Jason Mraz. Um, you know, I think the most recent one was with an artist named Rez, and then Benny Blanco, a really, really successful producer, did a, a studio session uh, with us locally just about a month ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of wonderful opportunities uh, that Grammy U provides to uh, kids trying to break into the business. Well, I think for those of us in the industry, you know, there's a certain obligation to mentor the younger generation, to talk to them about how the business has changed, what the opportunities are. Um, you know, it, it's fascinating. Many of the new opportunities didn't even exist 10 years ago. I mean, these are new companies that are serving um, a population of musicians who, if they didn't have a major label or a major independent label, 20 years ago would have found it very hard to find an audience. Now it's a little bit easier. It's not a lot easier. And the, the main reason it's not a lot easier is there's so much clutter. There's so many people trying to break through. Um, you can have your own website. You can, ha you can be on Facebook, MySpace, you know, Kickstarter, what, however you want to you know, raise your money or try to raise an awareness level for yourself. But it's, it's, it's very hard because it's very crowded. Um, artists who do get lucky enough to be signed by big labels, whether it's a glass note record with Mumford & Sons or, um, you know, labels, uh, major labels that have major artists and invest millions of dollars. They're always going to have a leg up because they spend much more money to get through to the public. Um, t they have those relationships that gets their artists on David Letterman more quickly than you will if you're doing it on your own. Mm -hmm. You know, the DIY movement is strong, but you know, there's probably a handful, a small handful of artists who are truly DIY, uh, who did it themselves, and, nev and never had a label backing them, never had that investment. Um, and you know, that's something that we explore in some of the classes that I teach, which is, you know, what are the benefits of doing it on your own? What are the challenges? Uh, what kinds of things can you do that might help you get a leg up? And you know, working with the students uh, so that they fully understand the trade-offs. Well, I think, first of all, students are always, you know, trying, trying to find sort of the next thing or, or, you know, what's the next kind of music that's going to be sort of going to blow up. And so I've had students turn me on to some really interesting, uh, you know, musical styles and, and, and different artists, some of whom I've loved and some of whom I haven't loved so much. But that's okay. You know, that's kind of music business um, and you know it, but they also you know it, it, it's a really great group of kids that, that I've had in these classes and I mean one of them ha you know was in a band that had a, an album on the top 200 uh, one of them was on America's Got Talent you know I've had some really interesting uh, kids come through the class who've had some interesting experiences as performers um, they wanted to learn the business um, you know and some who have never been performers never want to be performers they want to be on the business side of things and help, you know, artists and help those uh, songwriters and filmmakers. 
uh, that they love so much and, 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 and see if they can't um, help create uh, new businesses that may help um, artists make money. So it's, it's an, you know, I, I find it very refreshing. I find the ideas and, and, uh, and it's a very thoughtful group. I, I've been very impressed with the um, understanding, um, the depth of their passion. You know, mm -hmm. almost every single one of them has had some sort of an internship, whether it's been at public radio or a major radio station, whether it's at a record company um, or some sort of a music industry, local promoters, some of them have worked for Live Nation and, and the 930 Club, have done street promotions. You know, so they've all, you know, through those experiences, they bring that to class, and I think that's really, really helpful. That's great. It's a, ch it's a challenging time, and it's a fascinating time, and I think that's why so many students are really fascinated about the industry and are so passionate to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, frankly, surprised by how many students came to my first class, and all of them, with one or two exceptions, wanted to have careers in the entertainment business. Okay. Not all in music, some film, mm -hmm. some theater, some dance, but uh, when I, I gave them a, what I called their you know, induction questionnaire, I wanted to find out, is this a kind of a casual thing or are they really serious? And they were serious. 